the last class uh, we had seen uh, what are the non isentropic factors that cause uh, losses and we had identified uh, three of them uh, the momentum loss due to friction and the constriction of the flow passage these are not going to be very large uh, it said that uh, heat transfer to the wall is a major factor right uh, if you look at large motors the first two that is uh, momentum loss due to friction and uh, constriction of the flow passage will be smaller but uh, this component will be a major one okay uh, <coughs> uh, f1 engine for example f1 engine f1 engine was the engine used on uh, uh, the mission that went to uh, took uh, man first time to move right saturn 4 so f1 engine it is a liquid engine and uh, if you compare our own PSLV stage 1 and if you look at uh, the overall heat flux Q dot megawatt per meter square the F1 engine has something like 26 megawatts per meter square this is the heat transfer to the uh, walls okay and uh, this is somewhere around 13 so it is a very very large uh, heat transfer to the wall now there are two things here one if you want to maintain if you have good material that is a advantage here because then you can allow the walls to be at a higher temperature and still operate the engine okay but if you if your material science is inferior then you will have to settle at a lower temperature which means you lose more heat to the walls okay and this uh, in turn impacts the specific impulse if you look at the energy equation that we had uh, uh, for the nozzle we had uh, without loss we had written something like this h e plus right uh, now if there is a loss then we have to account for it like this right so if you notice this has a minus sign so therefore uh, you will not be able to get the ue that is required ue in other terms is nothing but isp so you will have a uh, reduced ue okay typically it is of the order of uh, something like loss in isp is around 1.5 percent because of uh, heat loss to the walls this loss is around 1.5 percent of the isp okay so if you if you do something like regenerative cooling most of it you can recover okay we will discuss about it when we discuss about cooling techniques a little later in the course now the next uh, uh, non isentropic uh, uh, the next uh, the thing that causes non isentropic behavior is uh, jet separation if you take one half of the uh, CD nozzle okay now uh, if you remember when we talked about uh, under expanded and over expanded flow right uh, there is a particular uh, criterion known as Summerfield criterion by which you can uh, say that if P E by P A 
is less than somewhere around point 0 0.3. PE is the exit pressure and PA is the ambient pressure. Okay. Up to this, the flow somehow uh, manages to adjust itself to the surroundings by having uh, shocks and uh, uh, expansion fans and shocks on the outside, right? Uh, but what happens uh, when it crosses this is the oblique shock moves it, okay? And you could have an oblique shock sitting in the uh, supersonic portion here itself and then what happens after the oblique shock is uh, if there is strong enough shock uh, the flow will tend to separate because uh, the Mach number will reduce uh, from here to here it will become subsonic right once it becomes subsonic that is considering the, the oblique shock is strong enough then uh, once it becomes uh, subsonic this is like a uh, diffuser and therefore pressure will increase right and uh, this has an adverse pressure gradient so you will be having something like uh, adverse pressure gradient in this portion in this portion and therefore the flow tends to separate so you could have flow separation taking place here and there could be a recirculation bubble uh, sitting there okay what it does in a conical nozzle is it acts as though the nozzle is cut off right here okay so it, it's just like you are using a smaller nozzle right if you remember uh, in the previous class we looked at uh, what happens to the performance of uh, uh, a contoured nozzle as well as a conical nozzle and we said that the conical nozzle has a better performance of the under off design conditions right if it is designed for a higher altitude and we uh, uh, use it at a lower altitude if you remember the graph is f by f actual by f ideal so if you have a nozzle designed for a condition here somewhere around 14 kilometers a bell nozzle would go like this this is right so if you look at this in a contour nozzle or, or in a conical nozzle uh, it acts as though you are cutting off the nozzle at this level and uh, further there will be uh, no use of this uh, divergent portion right so it is acting like a nozzle being cut off here and the shock tends to become stronger and stronger depending on what the uh, ambient pressure is okay <coughs> why does not the same happen in a bell nozzle the trouble with bell nozzle is if you look at the contour we want the angle at the exit near the exit to be smaller right 
and what happens is uh, it is not very clear as to where this uh, flow separation will take place. It could be on one side in one uh, area, uh, I mean it could be at a different place in another area which means there will be a tremendous side forces that will come on the nozzle right. It need not be symmetric because the angle is very shallow. If you look at it we would want the angle to be somewhere between 2 to 10 degrees right. It is very shallow and it is almost flat. So depending on which uh, place this flow separation takes place and that need not be symmetric uh, across the nozzle. So what happens is you will have enormous side forces and that is why you, you will not be able to derive any benefit out of it right. That is one problem and also because it is uh, it is very shallow it tries to accommodate it even further right. The angle is very shallow only you have a very high angle right at the beginning and then the angle is very shallow in a contour nozzle right. So So it tends to accommodate it and only when the flow separation happens here which is at a much uh, lower altitude then it becomes like a nozzle being cut off there right. So that is why its off design performance is a lot uh, worse than a conical nozzle right which is why if you look at most uh, uh, missiles or uh, launch vehicles the lower stages will have a conical nozzle primarily because it is going through the atmosphere and the expansions uh, ratio that is available pressure ratios are smaller. But uh, the higher altitude nozzles they will have a much larger expansion ratio and it is beneficial if you go for a contoured nozzle there okay. We will come back to this uh, jet separation a little later when we are trying to look at uh, how do we control a rocket motor right. If you have a launch vehicle or a missile you would want to take it in some particular path. So you should have some kind of thrust vectoring that is uh, to be allowed for right. To do that thrust vectoring you do something called secondary uh, injection okay. SITVC. We will discuss that a little later in the course this is where uh, this is what comes into use there. Now uh, we have talked about uh, non isentropic flows uh, let us now talk about uh, losses due to two phase flow. Uh, this is most predominant in uh, solid rockets not so much uh, in liquid rockets. Uh, also in solid rockets which use something known as a composite propellant. Now these propellants are rich in aluminum they have something like 18 percent of aluminum that is loaded in order to increase the specific impulse okay. Now aluminum when it is oxidized it becomes alumina Al2O3. Right. Uh, now alumina it has a melting uh, or a boiling temperature of around 2300 Kelvin. So in the nozzle during expansion process there could be if you are using a high area ratio nozzle right uh, it could reach a 
a temperature in the nozzle wherein the temperatures are below this right. So then it will start uh, becoming a, a liquid now the trouble with this is the liquid does not expand gases can expand in the nozzle but liquids cannot expand right. So because uh, this is not expanding it is actually causing a drag on the rest of the flow so due to which uh, the ISPs will drop because of this drag and it increases if you increase the aluminum loading if you increase the aluminum loading for some reason uh, there are uh, missile applications that will allow only something like 4 to 6 percent aluminum loading uh, there are more strategic missile applications or uh, uh, the launch vehicle applications which have something like 18 percent. So it will be a lot smaller in uh, applications which have lower percentage of aluminum and a lot higher in applications that have higher percentage of aluminum okay and uh, it is also known that this has some uh, uh, relationship to the kind of particle size distribution that you give to the aluminum uh, in the propellant. Let us say you have a very coarse aluminum particle it is noticed that this loss will be much more than in the case of uh, very fine particles okay. If you have a fine particle this is something like this uh, aluminum is known to agglomerate as it goes through the combustion process right in the rocket motor. Now if, if it is a large uh, particle size you all know from fluid mechanics that if you have a large particle in a flow the drag caused by it is much more than if you have a fine particle only right. So if you have a fine particle the drag is less if you have a large particle the drag is more. So people have noticed that there is some relationship to the particle size that you input into the propellant okay and that is why people have all uh, also been talking of something known as nano aluminum that is uh, if you have a smaller very fine particle size typically in solid propellants what uh, you use is uh, something between 18 to 25 micron aluminum now if you replace this with uh, an aluminum whose particle size is in nanometers right then they have noticed that this kind of losses is smaller okay. Uh, there is also one more problem uh, that sometimes uh, is there in uh, uh, if you use aluminum in propellant solid propellants that is uh, if you have a nozzle that can be flexed flex nozzles it is noticed that there is a slag accumulation because of this molten aluminum tends to accumulate and it causes a slag which could be of significant magnitude depending on uh, how large that cavity is right. So uh, it also leads to uh, an increase in weight which you would have probably not accounted for when you are uh, designing everything uh, this tends to increase the weight of the launch vehicle as it goes along in fact uh, if you look at uh, uh, the space shuttle disaster one of the space shuttle disasters this lag prevented uh, you know the hole in the motor to uh, from being uh, seen up to a very high altitude and then because uh, there was some aircraft that had traveled in that zone and this when this launch vehicle went into that zone there was air turbulence and because of which this lag uh, got uh, rid of and uh, again that hole became much more prominent and hot gases went and impinged on the hydrogen tank and that led to the uh, subsequent explosion of the entire vehicle okay. so Now till now all the things that we have discussed starting from divergence loss to non isentropic flow behavior and uh, losses due to two phase flow all of them uh, if you see are decreasing the ISP from what we had calculated right they are going in one direction. Now the 
next thing that we are going to look at that is namely kinetic flow effects this is going to in a sense increase the ISP okay. If you remember in our assumption if trying to derive uh, the nozzle equations right we had made one assumption saying that the properties thermodynamic properties are constant across the nozzle right from the entry to the exit the thermodynamic properties will be the same which means that Cp and gamma are going to be the same in an actual case this is not so okay. Uh, what happens is if you look at temperature and pressure right in the nozzle they are both decreasing and uh, if you remember your uh, uh, high school chemistry wherein you learned something about exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions when they are favored when what is favored right when are exothermic reactions favored. when temperatures are lower right. So actually if you see in the nozzle uh, the temperatures are getting reduced and therefore uh, some more exothermic reactions do take place in the nozzle right. So because of which you will get a slight improvement in ISP right. So uh, that is what uh, we has been noticed. we had assumed the flow to be frozen whereas reactions do take place in the nozzle because temperatures and pressures are decreasing so there is a certain amount of exothermic reactions that will take place. Now in a sense we are not able to uh, kind of uh, make out what is the extent of these reactions okay. There are two uh, ways uh, that one can get a solution one is if we can get the exact solution right if not the next best case is try and find out the bounds okay. If you have a condition wherein uh, you cannot estimate how much is the extent of reaction. Uh, there is a possibility of doing this in one sense that if you assume the flow equilibrates at each and every section of the nozzle okay then you will get a certain uh, improvement in performance right that is one bound. The other bound is it does not have any time to uh, equilibrate and therefore there are no reactions that are taking place. So essentially what we are saying is one is equilibrium and the other one is frozen flow the actual case might be somewhere in between these two right. If you look at the nozzle. Uh, the flow through the nozzle is a very very uh, high speed flow okay it has very little time to equilibrate right some reactions have some residence times if the gas has that kind of residence times in that region they will react if not they will not react completely okay. So which is why as I said the actual situation is uh, 
somewhere in between equilibrium and that of Rosen. Okay. Even if you, uh, there are computer programs that can do these calculations of specific impulse. We will look at it a little later in the course. Even if you do that, we are only going to get these two bounds. So the actual uh, solution might lie somewhere in between these two bounds. We will not be able to get a closed form solution for this. Okay. So now we have learnt in some sense uh, what is it that happens inside a nozzle, right? Uh, and uh, we have got uh, equations to uh, get the performance of flow through a nozzle, right? And we've also seen what are the shortcomings of these equations, right? In one of the major shortcomings uh, in the entire nozzle itself is that its adaptability to altitude, right? We have noticed that uh, as you have a rocket going through the atmosphere, right? Uh, the pressure varies from 1 to nearly 0 through the atmosphere and uh, you find that uh, even if you use Bell or uh, conical nozzle, we are not able to kind of uh, get the entire benefit that we could have got if the flow were to be optimally expanded at each and every altitude. Right? So uh, the next section that we are looking at is something known as unconventional nozzles. In this, uh, this thing, we were primarily going to focus on an area wherein we can look at how close we can have go towards achieving an adaptive nozzle. Okay. We all know that uh, adaptive nozzle is best because uh, it will try to uh, have the flow optimally expanded at each and every altitude and therefore you will get a better performance. right? Now if having studied all this conventional nozzles, we find this that conventional nozzles because you have the flow being confined in the, ex, uh, I mean in the uh, divergent portion, it can only sense uh, what is happening on the outside after it comes out of the nozzle. right? and therefore it has to adjust to it in some way either outside or if the conditions become too severe as we had seen PE by PA being uh, less than 0.3 then uh, the shock moves into the uh, supersonic portion of the nozzle. So one of the things is can we look at having the nozzle experience ambient pressure conditions at least one of the jet boundaries experience the ambient conditions throughout the travel and that is what is the idea of an unconventional nozzle. So if you look at conventional nozzle, the cross sectional area is perpendicular to nozzle axis and at throat streamlines are axial right 
and the other thing is external compression or expansion or to put it in other words external changes smaller influence on the flow through nozzle. Now, as I said, the essential idea of a unconventional nozzle is to have uh, it in such a way that uh, this condition is taken out. Okay, that is, it kind of feels uh, the changes in the external uh, conditions at least on one of the jet boundaries. Okay. This is annular by design. And at throat, streamlines are non axial. And the jet has two boundaries, and one of them is inner and outer. is free to adjust to changes in external conditions. Okay. Now, how is this done? Uh, Let us look at the first design. You have something known as an expansion deflection nozzle. 
this is an expansion uh, deflection nozzle if you see here the flow at the throat is non axial okay and uh, that has a certain advantage if you look at how it uh, senses the ambient pressure the external boundary is bounded again right but uh, the internal one can sense the ambient pressure and adjust itself okay so you will have you will have something for over expansion this is for the under expansion so if the pressure is higher the flow tends to go along here if the pressure becomes lower then the flow tends to go in the other direction okay so that it adjusts to what are the changes in the ambient conditions okay these are the flows distorted uh, no this is the uh, uh, jet boundary the internal uh, jet boundary so the flow is coming out through the throat uh, on one side it is uh, confined on the other side it is free to adjust itself depending on what is the ambient pressure so this is the jet boundary what I have shown in dotted line is the jet boundary okay. now as opposed to this you could uh, think of another uh, kind of nozzle wherein in this case the internal boundary is the one that adjusts uh, to the ambient pressure changes you could have the other one wherein uh, the outside boundary adjusts to the changes in ambient pressure and that is known as a plug or an aerospike nozzle So this here is the central plug and in this case the external jet is free to sense the changes in the ambient conditions and adjust itself right unlike the other one where an internal conditions uh, internal jet boundary adjusted itself in this case the external jet boundary adjusts itself and if you look at the jet boundary for uh, 
over expanded and under expanded it will be something like this this is So, in this sense this adjusts itself to changes in the ambient pressure and therefore, you will not have uh, the situation wherein uh, the flow after it comes out of the nozzle, uh, it has to either process itself through a series of oblique shocks and expansion fans that situation is not uh, does not arise here and therefore, uh, its off design performance will also be very very good compared to a a conical nozzle or a bell nozzle okay and uh, as a variant of uh, this aero spike or plug nozzle people have also come up with uh, something that is even shorter that is you don't need to have this entire length and you can truncate it here uh, which is known as uh, truncated aero spike nozzle okay so it should be even more shorter in length and and if we were to compare what is the length of the nozzle to the area ratio that we are looking at right. You have conical nozzle, bell nozzle and now uh, the truncated aero spike nozzle which one do you think would be very small the truncated aero spike nozzle. So, let us look at uh, some numbers for the same if we were to plot A e by A t versus length of the nozzle normalized by the throat diameter d t here is and l is the length of the nozzle So, you see here that to achieve the same area ratio the length of the truncated aero spike nozzle is very small compared to the uh, length of a conical nozzle or a bell nozzle. Now, this brings us to the question has this been used uh, in uh, any application well actually not uh, really in any large application 
primarily because if you look at uh, the changes that it requires you need to have uh, both in the case of plug and the expansion diffusion nozzle you have something uh, that is a large surface area that is there uh, where the heat fluxes are highest at the throat okay so which means that your cooling requirement will be enormous and uh, for a large burn time application uh, this has been very difficult to achieve and uh, moreover uh, the other reason for this is we have still not looked at any case wherein we are going from uh, from a, for a single stage to orbit vehicle if you are looking at a single stage to orbit vehicle then use of any of this would be uh, justified uh, but if you are looking at uh, different stages then whatever we are right now having in terms of uh, having a conical nozzle at the lower stages and a contoured or a bell nozzle at higher altitudes uh, suits just fine because it is operating within the narrow band uh, if you are looking at uh, bell nozzle or a conical nozzle and that is why uh, we are currently having this in, in the days to come if people go in for a single stage to orbit vehicle which will be more reliable because you have tested the propulsion system on ground and uh, there are no more changes to it that is the same propulsion system that takes you to orbit then probably uh, one needs to consider this uh, because then this would be useful because it is going through the entire atmosphere right until that time uh, people have not talked about uh, people are not likely to look at this very carefully there is also another uh, uh, nozzle that has been uh, coming up in literature recently that is something known as dual bell nozzle okay. The idea is very simple here instead of having just one bell have another change here something like this. right and there is a change in slope at this point due to which uh, depending on the pressure the flow will be attached to the first bell up to some altitude and then it will shift to the next bell okay and that people argue will increase the uh, delivered specific impulse uh, much higher than what we are having right now and uh, that is being contemplated or uh, being uh, tried out in various organizations. Uh, we will stop here and continue in the next class. Thank you.